So what are we supposed to do about aspirin and omega-3? Should we take them or not? I mean, that's a simple, easy question to ask. Um, I'm going to go to a, a bottom line on a couple of these things. I think the reality is that we're going to more of a personalized medicine. Things are getting more complicated, and we'll talk about some of those complications and how to interpret those um, in just a minute. Um, but first, a brief introduction. My name is Ford Brewer. I started off as an ER doc, got very frustrated, as most ER docs do, with the, um, the majority of death, disease, and disability coming in the door my, uh, my patients were bringing in that should have been prevented. Uh, so I went for training, went to uh, Johns Hopkins, loved it, did well, ended up running the program, and have spent a career um, teaching docs um, and patients uh, what I know about prevention. Um, <clears throat> this channel is a, uh, is a legacy thing. It's uh, wanting to, to get prevention science out there a little bit uh, wider. And uh, getting good responses, we're up to 7,000 views a day and a lot of interest. Uh, but again, I think I've whipsawed you, giving you a lot of the information about the ASCEND and ASPRE trials. Some of the other things I've done, uh, as I often do, I got the names wrong. I, in one of my videos, I, I continued to call um, vitamin uh, uh, B3 vitamin D3. Uh, niacin, vitamin D3, and again, cut a lot of flack for that. Many of you have seen it. You understand it. You've been very patient with me. What I'm doing, what I've done here, is called the ASCEND trial, the uh, the advanced trial, and I've called the ASPRE trial the Aspire trial. So again, <clears throat> thanks for your patience. But let's uh, get to these studies and talk about aspirin and omega-3. So what are we to do? Is aspirin dead? No. I, here's, again, my bottom line on, on uh, both of these is there are times when you want to take these. Um, I don't think you're going to hear about aspirin, for sure, um, from cardiologists, primary care docs. I think they're going to interpret the, uh, the ASCEND and ASPRE trials as saying, nope, it's dead three ways. And actually, I just saw a couple of YouTubes where docs were saying exactly that. Now, <clears throat> Ascent, let's talk about uh, why I'm, uh, I'm not so quick to, to agree to that. Um, first on the Ascent trial, the uh, aspirin did effectively decrease cardiovascular events. GI bleeds, uh, they sound awful. But with a GI bleed, you know, quite often you end up uh, having to go to the hospital. Most of the time you don't. Um, even when you go to the hospital, you're talking about a couple of days. With a stroke, uh, that's permanent. And with a heart attack, also permanent. So even the authors of the study acknowledge that the vast majority of the, the negative effects um, were... Um, were short-term GI bleeds. And let's go back and, and clarify that. Aspirin did effectively prevent cardiovascular events. Why did they recommend not using aspirin? They said, well, the GI bleeds over um, washed out the, um, the benefit. The risk washed out the benefit. Well, the, the vast majority of the risk is associated with a short-term problem, not a permanent problem like a heart attack or stroke. But there, that's only one aspect. There are several other aspects to look at in terms of uh, aspirin as well. Um, in the ASCEND trial, for sure, and well, actually in the ASPRE trial as well, they overestimated the risk of the populations. Both of these studies wanted to get uh, moderate risk populations. With um, ASCEND, and pardon me, that should have an S in ASPRE. With ASCEND, um, they got patients that had type 2 diabetes, uh, but no other risk. That was their goal, but no other risk for uh, heart attack and stroke. But um, they grossly overestimated the, uh, the cardiovascular event rate that they would have. Now, why is that? Mm. There are a couple of potential reasons. One of them is 
They included 40-year-olds. They started as young as 40. Now, <clears throat> again, let's, I think I cover that a little bit deeper in, in the next section. Uh, but one of the other questions is, are we actually, with both of these studies, and maybe we are seeing a trend, in cardiovascular prevention studies, uh, these are not the only two that have grossly over-predicted the cardiovascular event rate. Are we actually getting healthier in our older population? There's no question. Yes, we are. So <clears throat> there's, some, there's some discussion, and I think it's a very valid discussion. As we are getting better and better at managing cardiovascular prevention, that's what's happening. We are getting better at managing cardiovascular prevention. People are getting older. Why do you think people are getting older? Why do you think the largest growing um, demographic is old age? It's because we're preventing heart attacks and strokes and getting people through those, those really two to, uh, two to three tough decades in that area, and that's uh, the... 50s and 60s or 60s and 70s, however you want to count that. So, we are getting healthier. Why is that? Is it because of obesity? No. Uh, we have an uh, obesity and diabetes epidemic going on. Uh, I know I'm going to get a lot of haters on this comment, but I think it's from the treatment. There's clearly better blood pressure treatment going on out there, and there's clearly better um, statin and uh, other preventive treatments. So the question is, are aspirin and maybe even omega-3 getting washed out in terms of their benefit risk ratio because of a healthier, older population? Now, with aspirin, we always had better information regarding secondary prevention. Now, why, what is secondary prevention and why is that important? Um, <clears throat> Primary prevention is preventing a disease before it ever happens, like a vaccine. A measles vaccine, you give it, the patient never has measles. But with cardiovascular disease, we're not, and an aspirin specifically, we're not talking about primary, we're talking about secondary. Secondary is when the patient actually has disease going on, they just don't know it. It's silent. So, while we're going through that, I guess you're going to, some folks are going to ask the question, well, is there a tertiary prevention and what is that? Yes, there is a tertiary, tertiary prevention. Tertiary is when you've got the disease, it's symptomatic, but you prevent further development. So aspirin has always shown good results in terms of secondary prevention. In other words, uh, prevention of silent disease. Now, this is a critical point in the ASCEND trials. Um, I, and in fact, I learned this from uh, an old mentor and friend of mine, Brad Bale. His quote is, if you have plaque, you have cardiovascular disease and you need aspirin. And I would add to the quote, he also said quite often, and plaque is totally asymptomatic. So how are we recommending aspirin anyway? We recommend it based on uh, not me, we. Um, the standards are to recommend it based on age and risk factors. The standards have never been look for plaque. And that's, again, one of the unique things that Brad Bale and Amy Dunneen have brought to, uh, to uh, prevention. They're saying, look first, look for plaque. Now, back to the, C, uh, the ASCEND trial. Did these patients have plaque? Did they have silent disease? Was this a secondary prevention? Well, they selected for patients with type 2 diabetes. So you would think maybe anybody with type 2 diabetes is going to have plaque. I've gone through that rationale several times, and in my experience, the majority of patients with type 2 diabetes have plaque. Um, I've seen patients that have insulin resistance and just don't have it yet. And that's especially in the younger group. Well, that's the other thing about the ASCEND trial. They were looking for type 2 diabetic patients without any other risk factors. They also started as low as 40 years old. Now, again, uh, whether you've got plaque or not, you are much less likely to have 
a cardiovascular event in your 40s. So <clears throat> there's absolutely no surprise. And when you think about just that one aspect of the ASCEND trial, it is not, um, not surprising at all that you saw fewer events in terms of uh, the benefit side of the equation. So let's get back to uh, how do you know whether this is a, a secondary prevention or primary prevention? Um, CIMT. I, I think, you know, I had a patient and we had a very frustrating event. This patient's done great in terms of uh, his prevention. And um, yet there appeared to be some increase in his arterial age. We get really caught up with arterial age with CIMT. And arterial age is, act and actually that's uh, my most popular video, my own decrease in, in uh, plaque on arterial age from 70, uh, what, an arterial age of 72 to 50, low 50s. All of that's great, but what's the real purpose for a CIMT? It's great, but it's not totally perfect science in terms of um, age prediction using CIMT or arterial age. The real purpose for CIMT is to find out, do you have plaque? If you have plaque, then you clearly have cardiovascular inflammation and cardiovascular disease. Did they know whether these people had plaque in the ASCEND trial? No. They did not do CIMTs on these individuals, and they did not know whether any of these individuals had plaque. So they didn't know whether this was secondary prevention. They were just looking for both secondary and primary prevention. Uh, at the end of the day, on that question, we have to just acknowledge the reality that we just don't know. One thing we do know is there were very few events. Well, another thing we do know is that the aspirin did prevent events. Uh, the question is, was the benefit worth the risk? And that's where we're getting, getting caught up. That's one of the bigger challenges of interpreting the ASCEND study. I'd love to see the ASCEND study uh, reanalyzed for 50, old, 50 and older, or 55 and older. I don't expect to see that, though. There was another confusing point or, or another consideration that's a very practical consideration that's worth being aware of, and that has to do with intent to treat. I uh, heard this comment. There was a brief uh, YouTube video. Unfortunately, I can't provide it because now I can't find it again. There was only like 15 views. It came from the Cleveland Clinic, um, and I don't think they pulled it. But anyway, he, he made some, the doc made some very good points. He said these were intent to, to treat trials. Now, you may have heard that, and if you do uh, read any of these types of studies, sometimes you'll see that term, intent to treat. What does intent to treat mean? Well, intent to treat creates a higher standard, a higher bar. Here's why. With a lot of trials, if somebody drops out of full treatment, then they'll drop them out of the analysis. But with intent to treat trials, once randomized, always analyzed. In other words, if someone uh, starts participating in the study but decides a couple of weeks later, you know what, I don't, I don't really like this stuff. I'm not going to continue with it. Um, in, in most studies in the past, they used to drop them from the analysis. In the, in the new trend with intent to treat trials, you don't drop them from the analysis. You keep them there. Now, this doc, um, now, why is that good and why is that bad? The reality, the reason people are going more towards intent to treat trials is that we're, it, it's a practical way of looking at this. Uh, you're not looking at who actually completed the treatment, but anyone you intended to treat, anyone you recommended treatment for. Because these studies are being developed to say, should you recommend? And the answer is, uh, it depends on whether or not this treatment is something that it's impacted by, whether or not people continue to, um, to complete a treatment. Now, that's a bigger issue. I mean, it, it's, 
it still may seem a little bit confusing. If, if you're going to have surgery, either you do or you don't. But with something like aspirin, it's a bigger deal. And here's why. You may start saying, okay, I'm going to take aspirin. Uh, but are you going to take it every day for 20 years, a baby aspirin? Um, <clears throat> that's a bigger question. And with aspirin itself, you know, it's one thing taking it for a couple of decades every day. But with aspirin itself, there's an even uh, bigger question behind this, and that has to do with a temporary rebound effect. I haven't seen a lot of information on a true rebound effect with aspirin, but there's some, uh, some fairly light uh, research signals out there indicating that if you skip aspirin for a few days, you may actually increase your clotting uh, mechanism during that time period temporarily. So if that's true, and I'm not saying it is, and he wasn't either, but he had a good point. If that's true, committing partially to taking aspirin every day for decades may not be a good thing unless you're actually taking it every day because you go through these peak and trough periods if you're taking it three days and then stopping it for four each week. You may be actually increasing your uh, your blood's uh, tendency to clot during those four days. So, again, a lot of stuff to think about regarding this study. Um, I think one of the practical applications for us out of that is if you decide you're going to commit to aspirin, truly commit to it and do it every day. Now, let's talk about um, omega-3s. Um, there was a sub-study uh, in the um, advanced trial. I mean, see, I did it again. It's not advanced, it's ASCEND. Uh, there was a sub-study nested within the, uh, the ASCEND trial. Now, what does that mean? A study that used the basic uh, recruitment activities, the basic um, ethics review activities, the basic staff. It just paid a little bit more for maybe a little extra staff and did a uh, a study on something else while you were there with that same population. This something else was omega-3. Now, a, a couple of huge questions, obvious questions, and I think that's why you're not seeing a lot of uptake on the omega-3 uh, story. First of all, they used one gram versus three or four grams, and all of the recent data indicates you need three or four grams. And then number two, there was no, little to no clarification regarding EPA or DHA, and these are the components of um, omega-3s that are very important. And then what about the REDUCE-IT trial? Well, <clears throat> again, uh, it's very interesting to see a bunch of pharma. Are, are you going to take a pharma press release where they've tripled their, uh, uh, their stock price for Ameren? Um, pharma, pharmaceuticals, as your decision to, uh, to take a supplement or not? I don't think many people are. We're going to have to wait a couple of months to see the real story. However, I think many of us do suspect, though, that there is a real signal there. You hear the term when people talk about uh, research. What is a signal? A signal is, you know, is something that's coming out that makes you that gets your attention. Is it the be all and end all? Is it the facts? Well, let's go back and again summarize the best I know how to do. What what do I do? I, I give patients the facts and I give them advice, not paternalistic or, orders. If you want pater, paternalistic orders, if you want me to uh, speak in these videos as if. Uh, I know stuff that, that are, that's not known yet, or that I don't know. This is prob these are probably not the best videos for you. And, uh, and some of my folks, that some of my viewers that have requested, please bottom line it, just tell me what to do. This is probably not the channel for you. This is a channel to explore the facts and then make your own choices about what you do. Personally, so, so after I advise the patient, after I advise... Uh, viewers on the science, then the question comes up, well, Doc, okay, that's very helpful information, but what do you do? Well, regarding aspirin, I don't take it anymore. I did take it up until I confirmed that I had atrial fib. 
once you have atrial fib, aspirin is not adequate to protect against the increased risk for stroke. You need to take one of the new NOACs, new oral anticoagulants, and I do take Eliquis. If I didn't have atrial fib, would I take aspirin? Well, I'm going to answer that with a couple of, of statements. I do have plaque. And I'm not 40 years old anymore. So how about omega-3s? I still eat lots of salmon. I eat lots of avocado. And I used to eat walnuts and almonds until one of my family members um, demonstrated a significant uh, tree nut allergy, so we don't keep them around anymore. So at the end of the day, are we getting whipsawed? Uh, take aspirin. Take uh, omega-3s. No, don't take them. Well, no, wait a minute. Maybe you should. I apologize for the, uh, the complication factor, the lack of simplicity. I, I was trying to figure out how to, uh, how to draw an analogy. You know, Winston Churchill spoke at a school, I, was, I think it was called Haverhill or Haversaw or something, for, um, for their um, graduation. And he's, he said just one phrase over and over and over again, never give in, never give in. Never give in. Never give up. And uh, Winston Churchill was known to be uh, very good at confusing a battle cry with a speech. Uh, and that was one of his examples. But I do think that um, he hooked a lot of people's hearts and emotions when he did that. And I think that we need to step back and think about that as well. If you're, if you're looking for... One simple answer for reality that doesn't change, you, you got to start asking yourself the question, is that reality? Are you telling me reality doesn't change? Are you telling me that we don't actually get healthier? You're telling me that our old, older population is not living longer? Don't tell me that. So the science analogy for this may be uh, never stop listening, never stop thinking. Um, am I being overly dramatic? Well, if you think I am, maybe you should see some of the, some of the, uh, video, the comments we get to our videos. But I, don't think, I, I think another way of looking at whether this is overly dramatic or not is to think about, well, what are we talking about here? We're talking about cardiovascular events. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about cancer. We're talking about the life and death of many people. And so uh, viewers of this channel that, that hang in there uh, understand that, you know what? Sometimes signals are just signals. One study's never conclusive. We still have to make decisions, and we have to make decisions based on what we know now. Uh, what you know now may change. That's unfortunate. I wish it weren't the case, but it's reality. As I love to say, it's just not that simple. Thank you again for your interest.